So this is Aberlour Distillery, but if you look at the sign above the building over here, this actually claims to be Aberlour Glenlivet Distillery. And honestly, we're not really anywhere near Glenlivet. We're probably a good seven, eight miles away. But Glenlivet was so popular back in the 1800s that distilleries 20, even 30 miles away were tagging the Glenlivet name onto their brand to try and popularize their whiskey. So many distilleries were using the Glenlivet name that it became known as the longest glen in the world. But Aberlour and Glenlivet, they share quite a special and unusual connection that a lot of other distilleries that use the Glenlivet name can't claim to have. But before we have a look at that, we need to think about what made Glenlivet so popular in the first place. Back in the 1700s, it was hugely expensive to legally produce whisky in Scotland. Taxation brought into place under the Act of Union with England in 1707 made it nearly impossible to turn a profit, and this led to a lot of underground and illegal distilling. By 1777, there was eight legal distilleries across the country, but there was more than 400 unregistered distilleries across Scotland, and there was no unregistered distillery more popular than Glenlivet. Now, the early history of Glenlivet is a little bit murky. There's been distillation in the Drummond Farm region where Glenlivet's situated since 1774, when Andrew Smith rented land from the Duke of Gordon to set up his illegal distillery. But I'm not 100% sure if the whisky produced at this time was given the Glenlivet name, or if that was introduced later. But we can say with some level of certainty that the Glenlivet brand's been out there since the late 1700s. Now, the Drummond Farm area was an excellent place to set up an illegal distillery. Not only were the conditions, the water great, it also gave Smith an excellent vantage point to spot excise men and soldiers who were on the hunt for illicit distilleries. And this gave Smith plenty of time to pack up his stills, hide them in the nearby forest. And this meant that Smith, he could take a little bit longer in his distillation process, make something perhaps a little bit lighter, perhaps a little bit higher in quality than his illicit distilling competitors. By the time Andrew Smith's son George took over, business was booming, which led in no small part to a lot of other illicit distilleries using the Glenlivet name to try and popularise their whisky. Glenlivet was so popular that on a trip to Edinburgh in 1822, King George IV specifically asked for Glenlivet by name, despite his own laws prohibiting its production. And it was events like these that led the Duke of Gordon, whose land Glenlivet stood on, to petition Parliament to make it both easier and cheaper to legally produce whisky. Now this led to the passing of the Excise Act in 1823, which dropped the price of purchasing a distilling licence to only £10. And the first person to buy one of these licences was George Smith of Glenlivet in 1824, the year that you see on the Glenlivet bottles today. But by purchasing a licence, Smith didn't make himself particularly popular with his illicit distilling neighbours and his former whisky smuggling colleagues. They saw him as siding with the enemy and they sought out to destroy not only his business, but him personally. And this is where the connection to Aberlour comes in. So the former laird and founder of Aberlour, Charles Grant, he gifted Smith two flintlock pistols to defend himself with. And Smith used to carry these pistols nearly everywhere he went. And it's said that he used them on an occasion when a particularly aggressive group of smugglers couldn't be bribed with a drama Glenlivet. But after a wee shaky period in the 1820s, Glenlivet it just went from strength to strength, and this was helped in no small part by George Smith's Edinburgh agent Andrew Usher introducing Old Vatted Glenlivet, the world's first commercially available blended whisky. But that's maybe a story for another day. And while their popularity did lead to others leeching off their name, I think that Aberlour has got more right than most to try and take a slice of the Glenlivet pie. If it hadn't been for the founder of Aberlour, there might not be a Glenlivet to enjoy today. Alright, I'll be honest, that's maybe a wee bit of a stretch, but Aberlour is my village, you know, I've got to be biased, I've got to sing its praises. And I thought I'd end with a wee toast to Glenlivet. This is the 12 in the limited edition 1824 packaging. So if you've enjoyed the video, do give it a like, subscribe for more whiskey content, and um, yeah, have a good one. Slanjava.